Oh my goodness, that preacher makes how much? Hello and welcome to Curious Minds. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know I did. Had a nice long drive through some snow. Nothing like driving 27 miles an hour on the interstate in the middle of nowhere. So, thankful to have gone. Thankful to be back. Thankful to be filled with pie and turkey and stuffing. So, hope yours was filled with joy and laughter and Black Friday shopping and lines and crowds and cold temperatures and snowstorms. Speaking of snowstorms, I guess I missed the big snowpocalypse 2019 here in Albuquerque because I was on the road. But as much as I would like to be a star in the movie Frozen, I am inside to communicate this message, which I don't know if it's going to be as exciting as last week, but I did want to reflect on a little conversation that I had yesterday on the bus. And I want to emphasize this conversation because it's not entirely unique A lot of people who are casually followers of the Christian message without really committing and delving into it for themselves, a lot of them have the same kind of perspective as this man on the bus yesterday. So when he found out what I did, campus ministry, he had some things he wanted to dialogue on. And really the first thing that came to mind for him was these wealthy preachers. See, his perspective of preachers comes from seeing the ones that put themselves in the public eye nationwide. And who am I talking about? You probably said it to yourself, Mr. Joel Osteen. Now let me go on the record as saying that Joel Osteen is not the worst guy. Alright, he's probably super pleasant to be around. The fact is, this is the face of Christianity to a lot of people. Joel Osteen. Uh, People like that. On the women's side, maybe Joyce Meyer. And my, my beef against Osteen is not so much his income. He's got a big income, but you know why he has a big income? It's because he's writing books that people want to read. So every other author that's writing books that people want to read, we don't slight them, we celebrate them. Well, with Osteen, people are reading his books. Don't be mad at the fact that people are reading his books. And if that disappoints you, maybe your anger shouldn't be against Osteen as much as it should be against the general public who is supporting what he's writing. Last week, I laid out pretty carefully what I thought the Christian message was, what the gospel was. If that's not the center of a person's book, then I have an issue with that. You're putting out there a gospel that is no gospel at all. So I don't dislike the guy, but I dislike the idea of writing books that are very me-centered, that replace living a life of sacrifice to Christ because he deserves it with living a life that makes me the most fulfilled and tagging a little bit of the name of Christ on the side. That's abusing what Christ came to do. And that replaces inner and eternal peace with temporal, earthly peace. There are some other Christian TV personalities that I think blow Osteen away in terms of greed and abhorrence in their teaching. I'll just name three, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, and Joyce Meyer. Now, Osteen makes quite a bit of money, I'm pretty sure, but he has put a cap on his church salary. Kenneth Copeland blows everyone else away in terms of money-making. He's netted an overwhelming $760 million. $760 million. How does he do it? It's the style of his teaching. It's the way he asks for financial gain during his services. And he justifies it, as does Creflo Dollar and other preachers. They justify their wealth by their teaching. Now, Creflo Dollar, he's got books such as Claim Your Victory Today, Total Life Prosperity, Love, Live, and Enjoy Life, and Eight Steps to Create the Life You Want. Now, now the worst thing that I've heard from these money-hungry preachers is from Creflo Dollar. He was teaching about tithing during a church service and taught this about the non-tithers. Quote, Security would go in and apprehend them. And once we get them all together, we'd line them up in the front and pass out Uzis. That's a submachine gun. To the ushers, we'd point our Uzis at all those non-tithing members because we want God to come to church. And at the count of three, Jesus says, we'd shoot them all dead. And then we'd take them out the side door there, have a big hole, bury them, and go ahead and have church and have the anointing. End quote. 
if you're still standing and haven't thrown up, why is Dollar so adamant about teaching this? And where does the Bible say anything about the state of non-tithers? Hmm? Come drink freely is the heart of Christ, but also be maximally generous is the heart of Christ. Don't let anything stand in the way. Don't let any possession stand in the way of your relationship with Christ, but at the same time, none of that is really required. Be poor in spirit, but I think dollars should heed this same message. Be poor in spirit. Be as though you have nothing, and nothing will get in the way. Now, Joyce Meyer is probably the most recognized female teacher-preacher in the country. There was a time she publicly taught, quote, I am not poor, I am not miserable, and I am not a sinner. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That's the name it, claim it, that's resonating. And she also taught that Jesus went to hell and finished the atonement there and had demons jumping up and down on his back and laughing. Just an example of poor biblical hermeneutics there, but for some reason, poor biblical hermeneutics doesn't matter when you have a boisterous personality and when you have a TV spotlight. So we have a picture of TV personalities who make it a very big priority to teach about tithing, giving, sowing a seed to their ministry so that they can have things like jet airplanes and another house in a nice part of the country, etc., etc. And obviously the Bible would teach that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and that by going after this kind of wealth, it's been the cause of the stumbling of many people. And sometimes it takes those who have almost no conviction to go to church, dedicate themselves to the Lord, get into the Word, and yet they're pointing out the inconsistency at work in these people. And yet they're still on TV. Their support keeps flowing in. So I don't mind the guy on the bus asking about this issue and wanting to talk about it. It's a blemish on Christianity in his eyes. And I think my job last night was to be there to say, hey, this is not representative of Christianity. And the deeper I study, the more I see that this is not consistent with the central message of Christ, the gospel of our salvation, and the central message of the Bible, the redemption of fallen mankind through the God-man Jesus. So it's almost as though it was a relief to him that someone was there to say, hey, you're on track if you're disagreeing with some of that stuff. That's okay. Look at Christianity for what it is, not how it's represented by this minority. And it is a minority. Just because people are in the spotlight doesn't mean it's the majority view. This man on the bus brought up another pastor that could be important to address here. But I want to be careful about how I do this, because it's a person who should be respected. He brought up Skip Heitzig, the pastor of Calvary Albuquerque, a church of somewhere around 15,000. And this is where I don't think he was justified. You want to say Joel Osteen has weak teaching, um, seems to make too much money for his position. Okay, we can roll with that. And there are definitely people more extreme than Osteen, like Copeland, Dollar, and Meyer, making millions, and you scarcely ever hear them say anything about the central message of Christ. Okay, we'll talk about the, the issue you have with that. But Skip Heitzig? Really? One of the most influential men in Albuquerque, and you want to complain that his $500,000 house is just ridiculously huge and makes him greedy and manipulates the message he shares from stage? Hmm. Because I wonder how many members of that church probably have larger houses than he does. Probably a lot. And when he mentioned the size of his house, I thought, that's not that big, you know, in this day and age, especially when you compare it to a $42 million house of other preachers or multiple many million dollar houses. $500,000 house in the Northeast Heights. Okay. Does he have a large family? Has he been working for a long time? Is he, I don't know how old he is, about 60 maybe? Is well-educated, highly influential, oversees many employees, has a high-stress job. It would behoove him to live somewhere safe also because he is in the spotlight as he is. Is it out of the question for him to be in a $500,000 house? And we don't even know if the $500,000 house is from his church income. Is he greedy by taking money that could have otherwise been poured into church ministries and getting that? We don't know. Could there be an inheritance that's related to that? We don't know. Could there be a couple generous members that wanted to bless him a little extra so that he can live in a more secure neighborhood? We don't know. Does he use half of his house to house other people, to house guests? We don't know. It's not out of the question that he would do that. Now, the good thing about Heidzig and the reason I give him the benefit of the doubt, certainly, is because I've heard him speak from stage, and he does not talk 
the way these other preachers talk. He talks about the central message of Christ. He's not manipulative. He's evangelical. He's very Bible-centered. And I don't think it's ridiculous, the size of the house or apparent income that he may have to have a place like that. Seems very appropriate for his level of education, the number of years that he's worked, and the type of influence he is. Rick Warren's another name that sometimes gets thrown out there as somebody who's over-the-top greedy, over-the-top wealthy. Now, in working on a project a couple years ago about personality cult preachers, Rick Warren, one of the most recognizable names in the American pastorate, but I learned from actually reading The Purpose Driven Life, the first line in that is it's not about you. He overthrows what many other prosperity preachers are saying. It's about the glory of God to Rick Warren. I still think he makes quite a bit of money, but again, this doesn't necessarily come from his church. He doesn't have to milk the members for a huge salary. And he probably maxes his salary at a certain limit, as do many other pastors, as does Osteen even. Now, Osteen's a pretty high limit, maybe a quarter million or something like that. But Rick Warren makes a lot from those book sales. And there's no way to predict how much you're going to make from book sales when you write a book. So in comes all this income. And what does Rick Warren do? Does he turn greedy all of a sudden? No. Instead, he gives 90% of what he earns. Why? Well, probably because he doesn't want to cause anybody to stumble or cause any question regarding whether his motives are something other than Christ. He's got that heart of generosity that Jesus asked the rich man to have in the Gospels. One thing you lack still, go sell all you have, give to the poor, and then come follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And that's apparently Rick Warren's heart. There's a case for making big incomes, and it has to do with your expertise, your level of education. Somebody with a doctorate, obviously, is going to make a pretty good income, and a lot of pastors, especially pastors of the larger churches, have doctorates. Very educated, could take many other jobs that pay a whole lot more but they choose to do that, which, by the way, is probably the more stressful option and demands a higher workload. Pastors typically work 50 to 60 hours a week, I believe. So you've got a high-stress environment, a workload, a spotlight, very much in the public, having your words scrutinized. You make income from books, and there's a chance you inherit money or just get gifts from people. Doctors don't turn down large incomes. If they make way more than necessary and charge a whole lot for a surgery and won't perform the surgery until every last penny is paid and we consider that okay, why do we hold a different standard to Christians who are more in the spotlight? Should a Christian doctor go ahead and perform the surgery even if only half the payment can be made? Will he say, it's okay, I don't need all that much? And let's not just think about other people, other preachers. You probably wouldn't turn down a large income if it came your way. Okay, given all these things, having a large house or having a large income could be appropriate. But there's also the case against it. So a little bit of this is due to unfair scrutiny toward people who work in the pulpit. But people who work in the pulpits and do traveling speaking engagements and have book sales need to realize that this is the public perspective. If it's going to stumble the public by you buying a $40 million house... If that's turning people away from the message of Christ, don't do it. Don't be so eager to get a large, multi-million dollar house way out in the boonies so you don't have to interact with anybody so you can be totally set apart and not live the civilian life. If that's going to cause people to wonder what your intentions are in ministry, man, make the sacrifice. Make the sacrifice for the sake of the effectiveness of the gospel. Take less. Give more. If that's what it's going to take to cause people to be more receptive to your message. But if your message is that you should have an enormous house, I'm begging you, step back, look how the apostles did it, look how Jesus did it, and carry that heart forward that says, I am the meekest, the weakest, the poorest on this earth, and don't deserve to have any good thing from the Lord. But by his grace, he gives it. So what he graciously gives, I put on the line to give back to him, to give to people, to build bridges with people for the sake of the gospel. Why aren't pastors more aware of this? Why aren't big shot preachers more aware of this? Why aren't they more aware of the fact that they can appear greedy by teaching such things, by purchasing such things, by having their bling bling shine from stage? Why aren't they more aware that doing that is going to obscure the message of Christ in their midst? If you strip it down and live as though you're poor in spirit, that means believing that you have nothing of no riches of yourself that make you any more favorable in the eyes of God. 
And by doing this, you can eliminate the accusation that you're just in it for the money. You know why maybe that doesn't happen all the time? It's because people can't get over themselves. And this goes for preachers, just like it goes for athletes and actors and businessmen. They are in it for the money. And if they quit, they would have to take a lower paying job. They would lose out on their fame. But maybe they could go more the route of a Francis Chan, who had thousands of members in his church, one of the fastest growing churches in California. And he faced the reality that what he was doing was getting in the way of the gifts of other people. He didn't see it as a biblical model. In the book, Church Growth Under Fire has some interesting things to say about this. A man was told that his church could also boom into a mega church. hey, every pastor's dream, right? If he, quote, was willing to resort to cheap promotion or would run our congregation like a tight-fisted dictator, end quote. On the next page, it says, quote, water it down and people will come pouring in, end quote. He goes on to say that the church is, quote, the greatest mission field in the world, end quote. Now, that might not define your church, but there are churches out there that are sitting under this watered-down teaching so that people will come pouring in. And you may be one of those people who's come pouring in to hear a message that makes you feel good, that doesn't demand any sacrifice from you, but promises you great things. All your wildest dreams come true in a fairy tale ending. That is not the promise of Christ. The promise of Christ is you come and lose it all. Lay it all before the feet of Jesus and say, I want to handle none of this for myself. It is all worthless compared to the knowledge of Christ. And with everything you have, you lay it down before the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, what do you want to do with this, with what I have? Not just with my money, but with my abilities and talents, with my possessions, with my friendships. Because Jesus, I admit that I can be greedy, I can be greedy not just for money, I can be greedy for friends. And I often idolize friends to the point where I water down your message because I'm afraid of them. There are times I make a good image bigger than you. I make financial prosperity a bigger priority than you. I make comfort in my own desires bigger than your heart for the world around me. This is every man's struggle, not just the big preachers. But I wish that the big shot preachers would recognize the responsibility that lies before them to put it all on the line for the sake of knowing Christ themselves and seeing that others can know Christ in an unhindered way. And if you're doing something that looks greedy to the people around you, be aware of that and figure out how you can avoid that. And you may never be able to avoid it completely. Skip Heidzig and Rick Warren may have done everything reasonable to avoid the appearance of greed in their lives, but people are still going to talk because they're in the spotlight. And that's what you do to people in the spotlight. So we can't necessarily see the heart of Heidzig or Warren and know for sure. But guess what? It's not your responsibility to know for sure where their heart is with their money and with the way they teach. Your job is to hear and understand. And I believe Heidzig is here to help people understand the gospel. So sometimes we're going to want to make excuses. Sometimes people like this guy on the bus, maybe, will want to make excuses and say, I don't really want to give the Christian message a hearing because I think it's so greedy. Well, stop. It's not all greed. There's a message in there for you to hear. And stop using greedy preachers as an excuse to avoid the message altogether. In short, whether you like it or not, your lifestyle is an example of the gospel to those around you. And the gospel that you preach to yourself is the gospel that you're going to be preaching to others. And evidently, there are certain preachers who preach the gospel that they deserve to have huge incomes and huge houses and many friends, and they think that's the message of Christ to them. And so that's what comes out in their messages. And there are other preachers, like Francis Chan and most likely the preacher down the street from you, who's willing to put things on the line for the sake of knowing Christ better and being a more authentic follower of Christ. If the gospel is, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, that the price for my sins has been paid, and he calls me to go make this good news known, that's going to come out. And it should be unhindered by earthly cravings. So what type of gospel are people seeing in you, if at all? Is it the gospel of, I just believe in God so that I can be healthy, wealthy, and see all my wildest dreams come true? Shouldn't be. That's not the gospel. Or is it, I believe in God because it is the truth? Is it, that I love God more than whatever it could cost me? Should be. Would you yourself avoid the temptations of greed for the sake of the gospel? 
If you're willing to point that out in other preachers, I hope you would be able to make that true of yourself. And I hope I can make that true of myself. And I've got a ways to go. Like so many other things, this comes down to what are we afraid of and what's the big priority in us? And the root of so many problems is your view of God is way too small. If you hold God as supreme in your vision at all times, earthly benefits are going to fall by the wayside. But as you diminish him, earthly cravings become bigger. And suddenly, the presence of God in your life isn't enough. Confident trust in him is not enough. And you need reminders. And lo, even big shot preachers who we think have it all together need reminders. If we hold the simple gospel of Christ as supreme in our hearts, I think we can avoid a lot of this greed. But that's a constant temptation. It's a constant battle. And certainly it's something that the celebrity Christians struggle with. And I think we can run such preachers out of business if we collaborate and say, hey, we're just going to go to a church that teaches the truth, that teaches the gospel. I'm not going to buy those books because they don't teach the truth. And it reinforces their message the more we buy the books. I'm not going to go to that church because they're all into themselves and they don't teach the authentic truth. If we can collaborate against that, they're not going to want to teach those things. If they're trying to gain members, let's let the churches gain members that are actually teaching the solid truth. At the same time, let's be a little less critical and a little more gracious toward those pastors. Let's not support them by sending money to their ministries or buying their books, but to the ones that are around us, let's encourage them. Let's reinforce the messages that communicate the truth. So they'll be all the more encouraged to communicate those authentic messages, and they won't feel the need to preach me-centered messages for the sake of church growth. I hope we can do this around the country, but the trend hasn't been good. I pray that it would shift, that the American people would be able to hold the truth of the gospel, the core message of Christ, in such high regard that they'll refuse to support preachers who teach anything otherwise. Can we do that? Maybe we can do that in Albuquerque. Maybe you can start here. Maybe you can start with you a little bit. And hopefully people aren't just hearing the message from church, but you're also connecting with a few other people and reminding them what the core message is. In your neighbor, you can create a hunger in them for gospel truth. How awesome would that be? Let's push forward. Let's continue thinking well about the things that matter most. Let's call to account the greed around us, but most of all the greed in our own hearts. Let's teach and present the truth, and let's only tolerate the truth being taught, and prioritize that above the me-centered message. And let's see if we can set aside the greed in our own hearts and be examples to those around us of prioritizing the gospel above earthly pursuits. That's going to do it for this early December edition of Curious Minds. Look forward to talking to you next time as we wrap up a semester here at the University of New Mexico. I'll talk to you soon. May God bless and guide you.